Hi, my name is Thais Gibson and I'm the owner and founder of the Personal Development School. This is your daily breakthrough video and today I'm going to talk a little bit about a question that I get asked all the time. And this question is, how does my attachment style show up in terms of my friendships? So I see a lot in the comments and by the way, thank you so much for like the amazing comments. Like I'm so grateful to be doing this work and to be sharing this information and it's so cool to see like all these beautiful responses and questions and people learning about this stuff and it's, it's really beautiful and heartwarming and just inspiring to see so thank you for your engagement your interactions your questions your emails everything i am so grateful um so a question i see all the time in comments or a question that i get like personally sent to me around emails and this has been a video request from many many people um is how does um, my attachment style impact my friendship. So I'm going to go through today in this video, like a huge synopsis um, of just like background of, of um, what your attachment style might be in friendships. Cause sometimes your attachment style can be different in romantic relationships than in friendships. Um, so I'm going to go through that for a moment and how to identify that. And then a little quick synopsis about um, the different attachment style challenges we can run into in friendships in and of themselves like when we're dealing with people of two different attachment styles in a friendship, because the lines actually get a lot more blurred in this area. And then we're going to go through how to handle any challenges that you're running into or any problems that you might be having. So first and foremost, your attachment style may, will not necessarily always be the same in romantic relationships as it is in friendships. So <clears throat> you will see that it tends to be similar, but we can express a different attachment style with friends. So, um, our attachment style with friendships will largely base, be based on like first our interactions with friendships, if that makes sense. So at a very young age, if you were an only child and you didn't get a lot of like, maybe you had a controlling parent or, um, or parents, or maybe you didn't get a lot of exposure to kids your age. As a general rule, you'll be more of an avoided friend because your earliest subconscious associations for friendship relationships is that that aspect of your life is a little bit neglected. So you're more likely to be dismissive avoidant and require much less emotional connection and friendships if those emotional needs as a child to play with other kids, to express yourself, to share, etc., are not being appropriately met. Okay. Um, you know, thousands of years ago, or even just hundreds of years ago, not even thousands, um, like decades ago, really. Anyways, um, <laughs> we had like a lot more of a community base and, and this still occurs in many different parts of the world. But, you know, nowadays, at least in the Western world, we tend to find that like it, uh, there's a lot of single parents or there's a lot of parents with one child that, that aren't working. And, and there's not, you know, as the world becomes a more dangerous place, um, what's really happening is it's like, oh, don't let your kids play outside as much. Don't let your kids go to the neighborhood park with their friends at a very young age. And, and that might be an appropriate measure to take nowadays um, for some reasons and for other reasons, not as much. But, you know, what that does is it exposes children less to that relationship connection and then we're more likely to see more dismissive avoidant children in terms of their friendship relationships as they grow into the adult phases of their life. So um, that's one. Um, another thing is if you had a sibling and the other siblings were taking a lot of attention and you felt neglected by comparison um, and that can impact usually when there's their siblings closer in age, we tend to see um, more anxious friendships, anxious ind individuals in their friendships, um, or fearful avoidance because there's a lot of the comparing and the hungering for attention and, and there's still some socialization and, and connection, but we'll feel this sort of competition dynamic with um, different relationships in the home. So it's super important. So um, I also find that people who are the most avoidant in friendships, so dismissive avoidant, um, often come from a lot of enmeshment trauma. 
in childhood. So, you know, they're, these friends, like let's say this is one of your friends, they usually have this need to pull away because they assume the role of like the caretaker or the guardian or the protector or, um, and, and so they're always on, so to speak, because they're still living out those enmeshment trauma patterns. So of course they bring them into friendship relationships. And as a result of that, there's almost this inauthenticity that takes place when they're always in that role. They're not expressing their own feelings, their own needs, connecting to those places. And so it's not meaning to be inauthentic, but it's an inauthenticity, inauthenticity to themselves first. And the relationships become draining, exhausting, disempowering. And, and really then the dismissive avoidant friend needs a safe space to rest because they're always on when they're around other people and they need that safe space to retract and retreat into their own feelings and needs at certain times. And so, you know, when we come out of enmeshment trauma, usually our needs are almost com com consumed with like compounded by the needs of others, not compounded, like um, bulldozed with the needs of others. And so sometimes you'll see dismissive avoidance who don't even exhibit this so much, like they won't even necessarily take on the role of the caretaker but they might sort of pull back a lot and they might be um, internally feeling like they have to be on and that's not a safe comfortable space for them and and they might have needs that are very different from other people and they're subordinating these needs in these in these um, dynamics so um what's really interesting as we sort of bridge into the what the impact is of this is that um relationships friendships because there aren't all of these unconscious expectations assigned because we haven't seen movies and we're not having, having as many conversations about how friendships should be operating and how the dynamics should work and what we should expect and what our needs are, you know, those tend to take place more in like couples therapy, not like friendship therapy. Um, sometimes we will see that um, there can be more blurred lines and thus more chaos in the friendship dynamics. So friendship dynamics, when they're not working, have a much greater chance of sort of being shut off or, or being cut off and ending, even if we have these long-term friendship relationships because of the attachment style interaction that's taking place, being toxic, and then not, us not really having guidelines appropriately, appropriately laid out to start making changes that we need. So I talked to you originally about some how the dismissive avoidance can show up in friendship dynamics and friendship relationships. And you also want to note that you can be an anxious attachment individual in friendships if you usually had um, an older sister or brother that was close in age. That's, the, that's what I tend to see the most because there's this need for their attention all the time and they might be busy doing other things. And so we can become a little bit more anxious as friends and fearful avoidant most often takes place in relationships. And again, these are just patterns, general rules. Um, if we had brothers and sisters who made us feel very unsafe emotionally and teased us a lot or bullied us or traumatized us, we then become a fearful avoidant friend. Okay. Not all the time, but the vast majority of the time, because it's still based on like those core wounds and the programming in relationship to the individuals and that you're specifically applying that programming to. Okay. So as an example, the fearful avoidance usually have trust wounds, usually feel unsafe, um, usually feel like they want connection, but they don't fully trust it. So they need to pull back and protect themselves. And if those were the, the types of dynamics you were subjected to as a child in um, social relationships, so that of siblings, friends in the community, friends at school, then it's the patterns themselves that are impacting the attachment style that will then show up in that type of relationship. So it's not the person and it's not um, even so much like, it's, it's not the person or the friend or, or the parent even, it's the types of wounds you experienced in the type of relationship that you're in that goes with you everywhere. So certain wounds with friends create a certain attachment style. Certain wounds with um, parents, we bring that into our romantic relationships more often than not. Um, certain wounds with um, other family members, we, you know, aunts, uncles, those sorts of things, we bring those into those types of family relationships. So it's really the wounds themselves creating the attachment style and the patterns that existed as opposed to we have an experience with mom or dad and then that goes everywhere with us. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. So because there are less ground rules and expectations laid out um, in friendships, I find that people tend to have more 
challenges that create an end to the, the friendship or relationship, friendship relationship in a shorter period of time, because there are less, you know, conversations being had, there are less, um, um, you know, movies that outline how a relationship should be in, in a friendship manner, like a lot of focus is on romanticism and these romantic ideals that we see through Disney movies or characters. And so we sort of have like a framework, even though it may not be the healthiest framework um, that we're working from. And so when people express needs or say, hey, like, you know, you should have called me back because you're my husband or wife, or you should have been there for me because you're my husband or wife. You know, we sort of have these unconscious guidelines where we're somewhat following societally, whereas friendships, one person can have an expectation that, you know, if you're in need, the person shows up immediately. That friend is always there. And then that, that same, the other friend on the other end of that relationship could be like, well, I think we should just chat on the phone once a month and catch up. And so really our needs and expectations have to be discussed because the attachment style differences can, can make vast differences in our expectations in a friendship dynamic. So number one, if you're having an issue with a friend, a challenge is popping up, you really want to first try to define their attachment style and your attachment style. If you're not sure how to do this, go through um, the dismissive avoidant videos I have, the dismissive avoidance idea of a healthy relationship. It's, it's generalized towards romantic relationships, but what you're just looking for is the core wounds the core beliefs, the core patterns, and the needs. And you'll be able to define somebody's attachment style through looking through the dismissive, the anxious attachment, and the fearful avoidance. And then secure, you'll just generally see like secure, healthy conversation, boundaries, needs being expressed, emotions being expressed um, pretty consistently. And you won't generally really run into as many challenges with a secure friend. So go through those videos and get an idea of what attachment style your friend is. Okay, and then if they're dismissive avoidant, the general rule is that they're not going to have a whole lot of um, interest and commitment to friendships. And that's like sort of a harsh thing to say, but they're not going to be like calling all the time and checking in and wanting constant conversation and connection. They're generally going to want to talk like once a month and have a really nice catch up and pick up from where you left off or once every couple of weeks without pressure, without expectation, without any of that stuff. And if you're a friend that's trying to derive a lot of your emotional energy from the dismissive avoidant, like tell them all your needs and your feelings and, and, you know, get them to help you and fix everything. You're just going to push that person away. Like the dismissive avoidant is just going to retreat because again, they usually have that wound of enmeshment trauma. And so they just feel like that's being reinforced and reignited and they will keep retreating into a safe space where they're not um, governed by those, those not nice feelings for them. Um, if you are, it, seeing a friend who calls repeatedly all the time, or if, if the person has anxious attachment, let's say, as a friend, you'll see that they're constantly looking to check in, have conversations, maintain connection. If there's a disconnect or a break in the pattern of the friendship, it can cause them some pain or, or struggles. Um, and they're going to expect a lot. So, you know, you can have a, a, an anxious and a dismissive avoidance um, friendship dynamic. And, and there's going to be stuff over time that you need to have constructive conversations about and compromise your needs and your expectations in a friendship relationship. And lastly, if you see somebody who's really there and then really not there and really there and then really not there, you know, that can be fearful avoidant. And that can also come from a lot of enmeshment trauma as well. And if there's a lot of distrust from this person and a lot of stress and worry from this person, then and that can create that context as well. Um, or you'll see that that person's likely fearful avoidant. Go through the videos, learn about the core wounds, check it all out first. Um, and you'll also see that um, like the fearful avoidant and anxious, they'll have more fighting in the friendship. And, and the fearful avoidant will often like, and the anxious attachment really, they'll both often like expect a lot from the people around them in friendships. Whereas a dismissive avoidant might go, oh my gosh, like this is too much. So this is where we can really run into some of these patterns and challenges. So here's the steps. Number one, identify your own attachment style in friendships. You can watch those different videos if you need to. The fearful avoidance idea of a healthy relationship, anxious attachments idea of a healthy relationship, dismissive avoidant, same thing. I have those videos posted. Um, and you then want to, once you understand, look at the dynamic. I have other videos about the interaction. So learn about the interaction. Let's say, for example, between dismissive avoidant and fearful avoidant or dismissive and anxious or fearful and anxious, whatever it might be. Learn about the patterns and dynamics so you can actually navigate and understand the individual that you're close to or connected to. And um, 
yeah, so, so go through that and notice your wounds and their wounds. And then you really want to have, if this is somebody you really care about in your life, you have to have a conversation where you sit down and talk about what are our needs and what are our expectations in this friendship or relationship. Nothing will end a friendship faster than people having two different, very sets of ideas about how this relationship dynamic should work. Because the anxious will feel very frustrated and let down and the dismissive will feel very overwhelmed and will just deeply close off. Um, so share these needs and then have a constructive conversation about how to work through these core patterns. Lastly, I have a video around conflict communication and you can go through that video um, and it has all the major steps to properly addressing potential conflicts in relationships and you can just go through that and you can use that as a framework to have this discussion if it's you know somebody you really need to have it with in your life at this point. Okay, thank you so much for watching. I hope you're getting a lot of value out of this video. And um, I also just released a free ebook on the Personal Development School website. So if you're interested and want to download it, you can go to www.personaldevelopmentschool.com and it's under free literature. And I also have a list of questions um, about people's feelings and needs, the feelings and needs list, as well as um, 60 questions to ask, um, to self-connect, to connect to your partner, or to ask before you settle down for marriage. So check those things out. They're free on the Personal Development School website under free literature right at the top on the homepage. Thank you so much for watching.